This is not a piece of land that represents, you know, my Cree ancestry because we're from Manitoba. When I first came here and, and saw this first piece of land that I bought, it reminded me of a piece of land that my Cree great-grandmother homesteaded on. It had a very similar kind of rolling pasture field to a body of water, you know, it was on Lake Winnipeg. So I felt very much like there was a kind of almost like a homecoming feeling to being here. And then my mother's family is from southern Ontario. And so I feel like the farmhouse and this piece of land reminded me of, about that part of my background as well. So I just feel like a, a natural kind of fit here. To have your own piece of land that, you know, with my own studio on, it's a, it's a dream come true. Where do I see beauty? In my 25 years as a makeup artist, I've seen it in the hearts and souls of those who are authentically showing up in the world. I see beauty in the magic that happens when I meet someone in the moment, exactly where they are, even if their face is recognized by millions. I see beauty when someone has the courage to be seen and radiate their truest self, both inside and out. Come with me on a journey where we will explore beauty exactly where it lives, in the people we'll meet, and ultimately in each one of us. I have to start right where we are. This is your brand new studio. I'm just sitting in here and I feel like I'm in a church of, you know, your creativity. In thinking about the space, I wanted a space that um, could feel, um, you know, lofty, could have uh, the, the feeling of uh, openness and embracing the, the nature and the landscape around here. So I really um, tried to embrace as many views as possible on all sides of the building. Um, and that's something that, you know, in my studio in Toronto is missing. Okay. Um, but when you create your own studio, I think it gives you that option to create the kind, exactly the kind of space that you want. Um, and to have those elements that when you're in it, you feel inspired. Yes. I mean, it's just, you, you can't not. Like, you walk in here, it is living in here. Once I realized that whatever building I put on this piece of land was going to be actually a very large canvas, it wasn't, it, it could, you know, whatever art happens here could actually uh, be uh, on a very broad canvas, meaning the landscape itself. You do film, you do uh, performance and uh, painting and... So yeah, so painting is, is the first and most important uh, part of my practice because it, it was like the, the base, the layer, the foundation from which everything else grew out of. I love collaborating with people and I think it was that need to collaborate with other people that um, shifted my practice and opened it from just painting because painting is a very solitary uh, pursuit, you know, so here in this space I'm going to paint here and it'll be wonderful to have that peace and quiet But I don't want that, you know, right. all the time. Right. I, I like to engage with people Yeah, and, you're very and, generous though. And I have I have a team of artists that I, you know, collaborate with and the beauty of being an artist is that everything is a work in progress and it, you, you don't just rework the same piece because you could do one piece for the rest of your life You just kind of move on and apply what you've learned on the next piece right. And that's what makes it interesting and dynamic and fun is to just kind of keep moving forward. Exactly. So no sooner do I finish one project and you know, we're already on to something exactly. else. And there's always overlap too. So right. you're never on just one piece ever, whether it's a painting or an installation or a, a film or whatever, there's always multiple projects all crossing over and sometimes they inform each other and, and you, know, you might be working on something that shifts what you're doing on the next piece. So, you know, I'm right into, you know, the next project. You started out as an illustrator, correct? Mm -hmm. So started out as an illustrator, like Andy Warhol. Okay. And yeah. <laughs> Not so bad, right? I, I, you, know, you know, I was just a teenager. You're just a teen when you make these choices about your career, right? So at, I remember at that time thinking, well, artists, you know, they struggle, they, they wait on tables, and I just thought, well, you know, I can, draw, I can draw. I knew I already had some drawing skills that I could apply, and I thought, well, at least if I'm an illustrator, you know, I can put some money in the bank or I can pay for a studio and I can support my art career. I knew I was always going to do Do you already know from from day one? Always always knew I was gonna do more. How young? How young how young did you know? I think from the time I was four or five. Okay. I had I had I had an I an identity okay. and a, a shaped idea that I was an artist and I think I was fortunate that my, my, my family, my, my parents, my grandparents really supported that 
identification as an artist, and they encouraged it. I think my mom said, well, I don't know where you got your talent from, I don't know where you got your, your creativity from, but in fact, you know, she, she was a very strong supporter because she was a teacher, okay. and I think she's always just had her own form of creativity. So, uh, again, we didn't have a lot of money, so, you know, she could put, you know, a blank piece of paper in front of me and some crayons or whatever, and I could entertain myself. So it became, it became a way of um, entertaining and, and, and creative play. So I was never s sort of um, discouraged to, to, to be an artist, so it was the most natural thing for me to pursue it. It was more a matter of how do I go about okay. getting to that point. And because um, drawing, like writing or playing an instrument, it's, it's a form of communication. Right. And if you can draw, that means you can communicate. Right. So drawing and painting were two very important um, communication skills that I wanted to really develop. And I love that because your work is, for me, very texturized. I love the fact that there's, you have the, the initial thing, but if you want to go deeper, there's always gifts being revealed. I get asked about that a lot because, you know, some of the layers in my work are quite serious and dark. Yeah, yes. Because I'm yes. talking about colonization. Yes, and, 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 you know, some of, some of those things are, are, are very disturbing. Yes. Um, but I felt, I've used humor and beauty mm -hmm. to kind of, as a strategy, to, to seduce people into my work. Right. So, for instance, humor can really disarm somebody. Absolutely. You know, yeah. no matter who it is, yeah. if you get give them a chuckle first, yes. then they're going to be more likely to kind of say, "Oh, yeah. they're open." Yes. And then you can kind of, if they if they if they're open, that means they're more likely to receive some of the other messages Absolutely. and layers in the work. When you started your work with the abstracts, was that also when you also came out? Did your painting change after that? At the time, I wanted to deal with sexuality. I wanted to you know, express my own sexuality. Right. I wanted to talk about colonized sexuality. Yes. Why do we have homophobia yes. in First Nations communities when historically yes. our communities had a place for gender variance, right. sexual variance. We had men that lived as in the female roles. Right. Um, so how did our communities become so sort of antiseptic in terms of our approach to sexuality, this sort of European binary that had been, you know, applied to our communities through the the church and and, and the government. Right. I want people to understand um, the the history and the background of what two spirited means, because some people have not heard that mm -hmm. before. Can you shed some light on that? Well, I think historically it was that you know First Nations. Um, cultures had a place for everyone and everything right. inside creation right. so if you were so beautiful. yeah so yeah. if you were a man that was attracted to other men there was a place for you right. and you know the way it would work was that as a child as a boy if you were more interested in women's work then you kind of assumed the women's role and it was yeah, yeah. so that was i think you know how indigenous communities right. um, find a place for everyone because right. that person male or female, that's someone's daughter. Yes. Why would you ostracize them? Exactly. Or someone's so cousin or yeah. uncle. I mean, this is family. You live yeah. in communities where you rely on each other. Yes. A really important part of my work is that I want people to know that exactly. in indigenous America, yeah. we had yes. gay marriage. Yes. You could have a two-spirited uh, man who lived as a wife of a warrior. Wow. And of course, that warrior would probably have a few wives. Right. Uh, a berdash, as that two-spirited person was called by the French, yes. uh, could actually make a really great wife. Right. Because they were never on their moon time. Right. They were strong. Right. And, you know, I, wanted, I want people to sort of get some insight into that. And also, not just, you know, uh, non-Indigenous people, but for our own communities as well. Yes to kind of raise awareness about, about that, that there was a place for, for uh, you know, queer, trans, bi people yeah. in, in, our, in our world. Finally, I'd kind of had the confidence as an artist to come back to representational image making and, and start making paintings that really addressed not only art history, but, you know, sort of address these themes, you know, of colonization and colonized uh, sexuality more directly. Mm -hmm. And then in doing that, I think that's when um, things started to kind of change in terms of the perception of my work because okay. 
the work became kind of more readable okay. and accessible. Because, you know, as you look back at art history, um, I've been very critical, you know, of the last 150 years of art history. You know, I mean, I've been looking at, I was looking at romanticism already right. and sort of finding, you know, problems with, you know, romanticism because those artists like Paul Kane and George Catlin who were making paintings of First Nations people in the 19th century, those were very romantic images. Right. But in the last 150 years, it, this period of modernity, this period of modern art was probably, you know, um, it, it represented, at least for indigenous people, the most devastating period of, of history because it meant the, the reserve system, it meant the signing of the treaties, it meant residential right. schools, on and on and on. Right. So um, I've been looking at that period of modern art and looking at all the different movements, you know, since Romanticism, how it was a kind of breaking down and moving away from these sort of classical Western traditions. Yes. And so I've applied that um, thinking right. where, you know, they basically turfed their own history and turfed their traditions in favor of the next new thing. And how when those values are, you know, were applied to First Nations people, it was very destructive right. and devastating right. to have our, our, our histories erased, right. to have our, our cultures flattened right. uh, or obliterated. And right. so I've been using those, those idioms inside art to talk about, you know, this compression of culture. Your alter ego, Miss Chief mm -hmm. Eagle Testicle, when was the first time that she just started to emerge? Well, Miss Chief, the name obviously is Mischief, so a play on the words. There was wordplay in her okay. name. Okay. And, you know, the inspiration came from a couple of different sources. Um, some of the, those early sort of European settler artists that I was looking at in art history um, were, were very um, self-aggrandizing in that they were big self-promoters of their work. You know, a lot of artists have to, you know, promote their work. Right. But I thought that would be kind of interesting to play with that idea of the artist's ego. Right because you know, artists have egos yes. and um, they find themselves in their work and you have to promote yourself. So I use Mischief to, to I, you know, it created her to have that um, sort of egomaniac right. role where she's in you know, center stage and everything and you know, not, not, not unapologetic about yes. it. Full on diva. Full on diva. <laughs> And uh, so that's where her, the eagle testicle, you know, the okay. play on egotistical, right. this idea of, you know, this egomaniac artist who's always at center stage. And for me, that was also about challenging the subjectivity of those artists by putting my artistic persona in that role of power right. where she was the observer, not the observed. Right. So it was very much about, you know, putting her behind the camera, putting her in center stage and changing how First Nations people were perceived by you know, European cultures, by taking ownership of, of the image, by taking ownership of art history, and kind of you know, challenging directly the subjectivity of, of that art that was made. When I say the word to you, disappear, what does that mean to you? Those landscape paintings that were made in the 19th century, they disappeared, right. First Nations people. Those, those paintings were, were about uh, a European fantasy about North America being empty real estate. First Nations people were disappeared right. from right. history, right. from art history. Gone. And, and you know, that was what you know, European settler cultures wanted to do. Right. And if you compare Canada versus US, the US has been far more successful okay. at that because it's in their mythology okay. Okay. that you know, the cowboys came and they fought the Indians and they won. And now the Indian in their mind only exists as something from the past. They couldn't accept that, you know, Indigenous people could move forward into the present even though they didn't wear the same clothing. Right, right. So this is where I bring it back to mischief, always having this sort right. of, you know, fashion forward because right. fashion is really this indicator yes. of cultural right. innovation, yes. of moving forward. Yes. So um, that's one part of her character that I like to sort of emphasize that she's not a static. She's, right. She was never frozen in time. She right. continues to transcend she evolves. time. She keeps evolving. Yeah. And she's in the past, she's in the yes. present, she's kind of moving back and yes. forth all the time to counter yes. disappearance yes. and to, to make sure that she's, right. you know, she's front and center as much as possible. Right. So um, as, a, as an indicator right. that, you know, of resilience, essentially, right. That, right. that Indigenous people continue to exist, of course, in a different um, way than they existed when the Europeans came. Right. But every culture evolves. It's, it's inevitable and it's essential. What, her, what would her take on beauty be? How does she feel about beauty? Well, I think Mischief wants to be beautiful. 
So we, we work very hard to make her beautiful. Thank you, Jackie. I wanted to make a point about the construction of, of an image. Right. And mischief is very much a, a construction. I wanted to make a point about you know, the work that was made by these you know, European-American settler artists about First Nations people, that that was contrived image. That was a constructed image. You know, that period of romanticism, those, those were, you know, images made of indigenous people by cultures outside. Right. Those were not self-created images. Right. So right. in constructing Mischief, I wanted that level of contrivance. The fact that, you know, she grew out of uh, my work organically right. was just the most uh, kind of logical um, extension of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, you know, as a, as, a, as a performance character and, you know, as a persona, Mischief has kind of, you know, become otherworldly, you know, at times ethereal. Did that feel liberating for it you? It was completely you? liberating okay. because okay. one, I think, um, the, the inner yes. performer in me finally, <laughs> finally was let out. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd given myself permission to explore that as, a, as an artistic uh, direction. You're very successful. You combine, it seems to me anyways, art and commerce really well. Where does that come from? Is that just from you? Has that always been the way you've been? Well, I think um, the discipline uh, came from just the desire as a young person to just, just, I remember crying when I was a kid because I couldn't draw a horse really well. I was devastated and I wanted to be able to draw so badly. Okay. I don't know where that came from, okay. but I was so sort of, you know, um, motivated to, to, to be a good artist, to be able to draw and paint. And there's only one path to that, and that's practice. And that's why you call it an art practice. Like right. there's, you, you, it doesn't, you might have the, the kernels of the talent inside you, but you have to develop it and you have to practice. Right. And so for me, that's what my art practice has been about is about this deep-seated desire to be as good as I possibly can. Painting is a lifelong occupation, yes. so the more you do it, the better you get at it. Right. And um, that's something that I think that I've always just had the discipline because I also love it so right. much. So it was never for any, any musician, you know, who's accomplished, you know, they, they must love what they do in yes. order to spend those thousands of hours practicing. It's the same for me in terms of um, what I do. and. The great thing about you know, the spending the hours is you see results. And when you see the results, then you, it's very rewarding because you put the time in and there's this painting or whatever it is that you, know, you see the visible results and that's, and that's kind of makes it all worthwhile. So would you, would you say that's your meditation? Is that, like, is that how you... Absolutely. Like, you know, I think it's, uh, it's the thing that, because I, I do enjoy it so much, um, it becomes the most, it's, it's, it's this thing that sort of grounds you. Okay. It kind of, when, you know, you have all this turbulence uh, of, you know, sometimes the business doesn't go well, you know. <laughs> so, and, uh, you, you know, or whatever, your life isn't always a bed of roses, you know. Right. But if you have, for me, creative expression, and even, you know, I try and encourage other friends that, you know, have some creativity to, to practice because it's a form of meditation yes. that is very, um, it's very rewarding, it's very grounding because you are expressing yourself. Right. And um, getting that out is, is uh, it, it, it's, it's like taking you to your happy place, right? right? right. What's next up for you uh, in, in sense of, um, where do you see yourself you know, in your work or your life, like 10, 10 15 years? Well, I think um, as a, as just as a painter, um, you know, I've been working for many years to kind of get my skills uh, more and more developed. And for 2017, I'm developing a you know, national tour uh, which will tackle uh, the last 150 years, because Canada Oh, just the last yeah. 150 years? <laughs> I was just like that, right? <laughs> well, Canada turns 150 okay. in 2017. Okay. And this is a subject matter that I'm really interested in, is that last 150 years yes. of... Well, because you, know, you do happened? everything small. Everything, yeah. If anyone knows your paintings are massive. So, yeah. it's, uh, it's going to uh, address the themes of confederation. Okay. So, um, and what does that mean in terms of the last 150 years to Indigenous people? What does Canada mean uh, for Indigenous people? And I, like I said before, that period of modernity, that covers everything. It covers the reserve yes. period, the signing of the treaties, the residential mm -hmm. schools. And so the, that exhibition will encompass paintings, it'll encompass um, 
sculptural installations, video, and I'm going into museums and borrowing things from different collections across the country. So what's and that like going into like when do, do they just give you a key and you go in the vault well, and they let you go? Pretty much, yeah. So um, you know, I develop certain themes that I'm interested in, and then you just explore collections and find things. That's and some, and those things that you discover often inform what you make. So that's the next project, and it's quite exciting. It's just starting to take shape now. So, you, so by the end of your life, you'll have you'll have uh, you covered almost everything. Maybe. Well, I think you know you could probably keep going oh, yeah. with a mul multiple lifetimes. So, okay, Jackie, we'll have to, we'll have to revisit we'll have to in the next one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for spending time with me today. My hanging. Pleasure. We're hanging. We're hanging. <laughs> We're hanging. We're hanging. That's good. This beautiful catch. Yes, I know. It's very mischief. I love it. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. <laughs>